just uh, introduce the um, speaker uh, in the order they have uh, in their presentation. Uh, the first one is uh, Enrica Manenti, who is the chair of the Italian Library Association. Uh, the second uh, speaker uh, um, invited to the round table was uh, Silvia Trani. Unfortunately, she couldn't come, and uh, um, Marco um, Cabassi uh, will uh, uh, read her uh, presentation. Okay. <laughs> Um, we uh, planned to have also Daniele Yalla, uh, who unfortunately is not coming, and uh, Susan Lorraine Allard. Uh, she unfortunately uh, has had the cancellation of her flight, but Susi has been replaced by uh, Patricia Montiel Overall, who can uh, read her presentation. And then we have Patricia Montiel Overall from IFLA, uh, Library Theory um, section, but also she is um, uh, Alice representative in our session. For Euclid, we have the chair of Euclid, Serap Kurbanoglu, and uh, uh, the last uh, um, presenter is Maurizio Vivarelli from the University of Turin. Uh, all uh, of these um, uh, speakers have had two questions, uh, which uh, are in, uh, really in a strict, uh, concise uh, uh, summary what uh, we have to think um, the conclusion of this satellite, but especially the follow-up, because this round table want to start a community interested in this convergence issue and continue to work on it. And so the round table is just uh, the beginning, not the end. And uh, the first question, uh, where, um, what are best practice in education for LIM convergence? Uh, this has been uh, a late motive of the last day, and uh, uh, we have to start from education if you, we really want convergence. Uh, there are many good practice, and uh, we want to know from the presenters in particular what is their experience. Uh, then uh, the second question is uh, focused on technology. And uh, uh, what are the theoretical approach to technology? Because sometimes technology is misunderstood, is uh, understood only as some technicalities. Uh, instead, uh, there is a lot of conceptual um, things in the technology. And uh, if we don't dominate enough technology, these conceptual things are done by computer scientists, which I appreciate very much, all of you <laughs> together with me. But uh, uh, this conceptual uh, decision cannot be exactly what uh, we could do as professional uh, involved uh, in controlling technology. And so the second question is, what are the different uh, theoretical approach to technology, and, and uh, starting from some particular role as digital curator, data curator, we have listened during yesterday and also today. And so these are the questions. Um, we can start from um, the first speakers, uh, uh, which is um, Enrica Manenti. Thank you. Uh, this is okay. This is the first. And um, I'll try to, I would like to tell you something about myself. Uh, over the past few days, we have been talking about convergences and difference between archivists, librarians, and museologists. Several speakers have already talked about this topic from the, a theoretical point, standpoint. I thought that it would be useful to take my personal experience as an example, but don't worry. I don't want to describe my whole career to you, but perhaps something will prove to be of interest for our discussion. I read medieval history at university and wrote my thesis in archive keeping. 
Besides my certificate in archivistry, paleography, and diplomatics, I have a postgraduate degree in museology and museography from Milan Polytechnic, and I did a two-year postgraduate course in librarianship at the University of Parma. Later, I did several courses on information technology for archivists and librarian. In 1982, I was employed by Panini Publishing House, specializing in printing picture cards, to set up the Picture Car Museum, at first situated in the company headquarters and currently located in the Municipal Gallery in Modena. I worked here until 1992, as soon we can say that we were still in the analog age. What I'll try to tell you are the cultural and practical problems I have experienced during this time relating to archives, archives libraries, and museums, and the decision we have, I have taken. At the end, I'll try to imagine the same process in the digital environment, just to compare the problems and the solution so as to see if something could be done differently. First of all, I was selected for this job as an archivist, and my initial approach was from this point of view. The picture cards are uh, very interesting materials, and the Museum of Modena is the biggest public collection of its, of its kind in the world, hundreds of thousands of pieces. The collection uh, starts from small ancient gravures of the 18th century and goes up to the industrial production, starting from the 1960s. Italy was international leader in this publishing field, and uh, it is still. As I was working in a private company, where it was important to derive benefits from the presence of the museum, uh, we must consider that the problem of access, one of the focus points of the Anna Maria talk yesterday, was always been present. So we must do theory, but also we must be practical. And um, so uh, we, I face a different question. I try to cut, but uh, I think it's nice uh, for our discussion. The first question was, how can I see to rearranging these materials? What does the concept of collection and provenance mean in this environment? After carrying out four months of experiments, we decided that it was not possible to respect this archival criterion because the exemplar has been mixed several times in collector's end. What does the concept of series mean for picture cards, but also for images from matches, boxes, menus, postcards, and so on? Librarians and archivists know this element, but perhaps a better contribute may come from art history. At the end, I decide that for picture cards, the link between the cards composing a series is really strong. So the whole collection was to be seen as a large number of series. The third big question was, which other cultural institution I should try to contact in order to share the scarce information available on the artists, printers, and companies? In other words, what is this collection? I should, it should be a part of a library specialized in prints or in art, as in Modena, my town was, there was the Poletti, Poletti Library. It, will, it uh, should be a, a museum, as the owner preferred, taking into account that you have also objects such as lithographic stone, for example. A, a part of the museum of the city of Modena, we have different choice in front of us. In the end, we decide to forge a relationship with all the types of cultural institution which hold materials of interest for us. So, the British Museum for the Wharton Tiger Collection. Let me see some example. The Museum für Deutsche Forskunder in Berlin, now is the Museum of Rekobischke Culture for the cut papers. The Civica Raccolta Bertanelli of Milan for posters, calendars, menu, visiting cards, and so on. And 
The fourth question was, which catalogue standard, or rather according to those time, which rules should I use to describe this card? In those days, around 1988-1990, the best defined rules were the ones adopted by the libraries. I tried to create a prototype of a cataloging schedule starting from the Italian rules for cataloging author and the subject index of Florence. In 1990, uh, due to the fact that Panini had changed owners from the Panini family to Ma the Maxwell Group, I asked the National Artistic Heritage Authority to recognize the museum's important, important historical and cultural value in order to protect it from being dismantled and dispersed. So at the end, all the institutions, all the professional figures and all the educational course have played an important role in this story. I brought in elements from the professional skill of librarians, archivists and museum experts. If you bring this story towards 20 years, to digital age, I think that I would probably solve the first problem in the same way. But probably the solution adopted to identify cultural institutions to propose a collaboration with would be, uh, have been more effective. Uh, uh, the digital age is really powerful for us. And uh, uh, I left this job in 1992. My colleagues uh, still working in the Picture Car Museum are collaborating in this Imago project, which is a, a regional project. And you may find together catalogs and images from archives, libraries, and museums. And it was really unthinkable just 20 years ago. With respect, again, to the issue of access, you can imagine the success that had the museum when the company pr uh, promoted for its young customers to create a virtual Panini collection on the web. If we, we had digital, had our, uh, our cards in digital uh, format, perhaps it was really a big uh, chance for the company, also from the economic point of view. And uh, regarding the last the question of, of Anna Maria, I think that in, in for LAM education there is still, even in Italy, some small collaboration. But I, I think they are, um, as we may say, um, side collaboration. There is a main topic, main uh, argument, and then as uh, uh, enrichment, we have some sides contributions. Uh, while we must try to do some, something more effective, more, perhaps more difficult to do, but more interesting, according to me. And uh, um, re uh, regard uh, the theoretical approaches to technology, uh, I uh, Perhaps in, in part I have already uh, answered uh, because uh, I think some things are, uh, are um, similar, um, are the same problem, no? as I tried to told before. Uh, but uh, the digital environment, the digital professional skin of the curator, digital curator, data curator, are really the powerful chance for us to do really more and be more effective. And uh, with, uh, we, uh, we have problem uh, for founding, uh, no? as you know, in Italy, for cultural institution, and this would be really a chance for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erika. And uh, now, uh, Marco, I think you can read from the table. Yeah, thank you. Um, numerous factors have contributed to the definition of a broadly accepted identity for archivists in Italy over the last few years. First, there is a national legislative framework which is largely responsible for the way in which archivists have regained control over records as from the time of their creation. Though always recognized in theory, this concept has been forgotten in practice 
by the National Archival Community in its long and almost exclusive focus on the historical dimension of archives. Within the state sector, Italian legislation now assigns responsibility for records management and, more recently, for digital preservation to figures that belong, or in any case can belong, to the archival sphere. We refer respectively to the Responsabile del Sistema di Gestione Documentale, head of the records management system, and to the Responsabile della Conservazione Digitale, roles that can also be performed by the same person. Then we have the UNI uh, 11536 standard on the professional figure of the archivist, drafted with the active participation of the Archival Association, published in July and illustrated yesterday by its initiator, Giovanni Michetti. The standard identifies the requisite for, of knowledge, skills, and technical cultural qualifications for performance of the activities that define the professional archivist in accordance with the European qualifications framework. In particular, the technical uni standard identifies as key responsibilities of the archival profile those regarding control over records throughout the entire period of their existence, the communication of records through the provision of services for users, the promotion of awareness of documentary materials, specialized training and activities of study and research, and third, the direction and administration of an archival structure or service. Finally, the archivist professional profile is also accompanied today by a largely convincing conceptual and methodological framework, as well as adequate forms of training. In accordance with its role as an observatory monitoring the profession, the Archival Association has, however, recently began to consider whether the archivist's present-day profile is complete, in need of further clarification, or still lacking in elements. This question has arisen through awareness of the existence of new skills and activities developed within the sphere of projects for the online description and communication of digital objects belonging to all the sectors of cultural heritage and hence also the archives. As an example of the new skills and knowledge required on the job market, we shall examine the external professionals hired by the ICAR, or Central Institute, Institute for Archives, Instituto Centrale per gli Archivi, in the period 2012-2014. It should be recalled that the ICAR's responsibilities include the management, maintenance, and development of national archival information systems, including the SAN, Sistema Archivistico Nazionale, the National Database of Archival Resources. The SAN constitutes a point of integrated access to the Italian archival heritage with a catalog of archival resources and a digital library providing descriptions of digital objects and archival materials of heterogeneous nature and origin that could previously be accessed only separately. The personal selection procedures were and are designed to identify professional figures 
combining archival and ICT skills for employment as digital content creators. The primary elements of the job description are as follows. Support in the activities of adaptation, control, and standardization of the descriptions of archival materials, records creators, institutional profiles, and historical and institutional contexts present in the SAN and in the related information systems of the archives administration, especially the State Archives Information System, SIAS, and the General Guide of the Italian State Archives. The description of archival digital objects found during the surveys, the processing of digital contents acquired from subject connected with the SAN, editing, aggregation, and integration, the inputting of content into the SAN by means of the content management system of the SAN portal, and the thematic portals connected with the same, publication of the ISAR website, publication of the ISAR newsletter. External personnel are also involved in the activities of study and research carried out by the ISAR in the sectors of standards, preservation in the digital environment, records management, and more recently the development of data in RDF, Resource Description Framework, format for channeling into the linked open data, LOD, repository of the SAN. The educational prerequisite for admission to the selection procedures is normally a degree or master's as specified by the relevant ministerial decrees. At least two years of professional experience is then required above all in the management and organiza organization of cultural heritage content with a particular focus on the archival sector and the use of web content management systems. The other skills required in addition to English are a knowledge of the primary archival standards, the major models of resource description and applied profiles the main open source CMS and the Muse Musee and Web CMS and the leading digital library systems. The preferential requisites often include a diploma in archival science, paleography and diplomatics from a state archive school or other qualification regarded as equivalent. Further requisites include a knowledge of the rules of construction, application, and management of ontologies and thesauruses, and the primary national and international technical standards related to the digital cultural heritage and marking languages such as XML. Uh, the Sapienza Digital Library Project, uh, the University of Rome, provides stimuli for reflection on the overlapping of spheres in the field of cultural heritage. The purpose of this project was to create an information system capable of storing and making available documentation produced both by research groups working inside La Sapienza University of Rome and by parties external to, uh, to the academic community. The SDL is not an institution for the preservation and accessibility of physical resources, but rather a second level catalog of reference to the catalogs of institutions holding such analogical objects or to a specific query interface for complex databases. The material described is markedly heterogeneous in terms of nature, including documents, books, periodicals, musical scores, 
photographs, films, audio and video recordings, and 3D reconstructions. Provenance, differing as regarding creation and preservation in archives, libraries, and museums. And third, methodological and disciplinary sector. The SDL adopts the metadata object description scheme to map the standards of description of structure and content belonging to different fields. Mark, Dublin Core, ISAD, EAC, EAD, Lido. Moreover, particular attention was focused in the planning of the SDL on standardization so as to ensure interoperability and consist consistency in the description of the resources. Use is therefore made of authority files and thesauruses identified in relation to the relevant international standards, the characteristics of the materials to be described in, and the requirement of linked data. The following standards were thus adopted as points of reference. First, for places, the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names and Geonames. Two, for the names of persons and bodies, the Virtual International Authority Files. Three, for roles, the Pico Thesaurus and the Mark Code List for Relators. Four, and for subjects, the PICO once again, as well as the Nuovo Soggettario, developed by the National Library of Florence. In our view, the solutions developed and adopted by the Sapienza Digital Library in order to communicate digital records constitutes an exemplary case of compromise and mediation between different and indeed antagonistic purposes and requirements. On the one hand, the interoperability of different systems and universes of knowledge. On the other, the specialized nature of the information handled. For example, confirmation is provided of the fact that it is impossible to rely on a single descriptive model and its languages of reference in digital systems of communication containing heterogeneous resources. As emerged in a number of international initiatives, including Europeana, the elimination of descriptive specificity results in a lower level of quality of the processing and presentation of digital sources. Uh, feet cut off by the short bed in uh, ancient Greek, Greece. The SDL project also demonstrates that by comparison with those of the other disciplines, archival standards make it possible both to describe a broad and variety range of documentation and to focus equal attention on the acquisition and presentation of information on the provenance, context, and history of the resources described. Moreover, the adoption of a typically archival multi-level kind of description captures the specificity of the various layers and articulation of the collections. Finally, by comparison with the descriptive standards and practices of other disciplines, the adoption of archival descriptive criteria not only ensures greater and more general richness of information, but also endows the context of preservation with a certain degree of authority. As regards the influence of other disciplines, attention should instead be drawn to bibliographical science and its traditional focus on developing tools to standardize and control the keys of access to information. The Italian archival community has only recently devoted 
particular attention to this question. Until the mid-1990s, the only indications on indexing developed by the Archives Administration were indeed to be found in a circular of 1966 on standards for the publication of the inventories, where the references to indexes was very summary. It is specified only that an inventory must generally be provided with a single index of people, surname and name, and places. The possibility is also envisaged in relation to the characteristic of the archival fonts inventoried of having further but unspecified indices in addition to those of persons and places. The literature also, I'm at nearly at the end, the literature also includes no particular studies on the subject of indexes and still less of subjects. The archival stool, tools published in the Archives Administration series of State Archives pub publications normally include the three types of index, denominations of institutions and agencies, names of persons and place names but the criteria applied are not uniform. These legislative innovations thus make it urgently necessary to answer the questions of whether the new skills required in the sector of cultural heritage constitute an evolution of the traditional professions and whether new professional figures are coming into existence. Thank you. I try to insert the Susie Allard, or oh, you have the... Okay, okay. I'm just going to do it yeah. here. Yeah. Is, that, is that all right? But I cannot uh, connect to the projector. Yeah, but I, I think I'm going to just talk. It's okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I... Is it on? Okay, thank you. I thought I would change the pace a little. I see some... Uh, uh, it, it's getting late. So let me ask a question. How many of you are librarians or working in a library right now? If you raise your hand. How many of you are in archives? And how many of you are in museums? Only four. Well, I'm going to talk about something that... Um, it has not been brought up and it was on the program or I thought we were going to talk about a little bit more and that is cultural competence. I had two things to discuss, cultural competence and collaboration, but I think I'm going to focus on the first one. Um, in the work that we're doing in, in, at the University of Arizona, culture as I'm defining it is the daily activities that happen within groups or organizations. So archivists have a culture, museums have a culture, librarians have a culture. And that cultural competence that I'm referring to is the ability to understand and work within the different cultural groups. So that's one part of the cultural competence, and a, a, the, a model that we're using has three circles. The first is cognitive domain, the second is interpersonal, the third is environmental. So in the cognitive, you have to know your own culture. What is it that you uh, do? What is it that you think? And where did you get your ideas from? So if we're talking about education, um, and she, uh, Ana Maria was asking us for best practices for education. One of the first things that uh, we're trying to do is to get our students to think about their own cultural background. Where did they get their ideas from in terms of uh, many students come into the library uh, school, the School of Information Resources and Library Science, and they have no idea that we're moving into technology. I say, why are you here? Oh, I love books. I've always liked to read. I always went to the library as a child. 
Um, and they really, and I, they really do not want to teach, and they do not want to really be around people. <laughs> they would rather be behind a desk. And that's not who we are. We're interested in people, we're interested in services to, we're, I've heard through yesterday's presentation, um, we're user, we're, we're, we're thinking more about the user. And secondly, um, if we're going to change society, if we're going to get people to begin to think about us as a different uh, entity, it has to begin with us understanding our own selves and who we are and what we're doing, what are our archivists doing, and how are they working, and how are our museum curators working. And to be able to clearly define that role. So that would be the first domain, the cognitive domain. The interpersonal is getting to know the second, the, the other. And to understand the relationship between the personal, who you are, what you're doing, how you feel, why you think the way you think. And, and by the way, we think the way we think uh, based on a lot of things, not just our education, but our background, our experiences, our prior knowledge, and it's very, very difficult to strip that identity. I think we can change our, our hair color, we can change our job, we can change our husband easier than we can our identity, you know, who we are. We can, th that is like, what do you mean? I, you've said something, I don't agree with that. Beca why? Well, we don't do it that way, uh, you know, or we, I, I, I've never thought of doing it another way or thinking about it another way. Anyway, so the interpersonal domain has to do with this collaboration we were talking about yesterday. I get the feeling from listening to the word used here that we're really talking about two different things. The collaboration I was talking about yesterday is where you come together and think together, plan together, and come up with something new together. So what's new is that has come from the synergy. I've heard all the words, but I don't think we're doing that in, from this morning's breakfast conversation. It sounds like it wouldn't happen in Italy anyway. It's very, very difficult to get that to happen. And the research I was talking to you about was between teachers and librarians. And we had to actually sit down and role play what it looked like for teachers who are in their silo and librarians who were in their silo. We had to show them what it looked like to plan a lesson together in which the content was um, developed in part by the librarian, so the librarian would know how to integrate technology and information literacy. But the teachers did not get it. They were willing to cooperate. Would you please get me a whole section of books on insects, or we need to do a web pro project in science. Can you set that up for us? But to sit down and think of how it would work together was very, very difficult. So I think what we're really talking about, we can use the word, but I just want to make clear that the, if we look deeply at what collaboration is, we're not doing it. And I wonder how many of you at school, we're talking about education again, how many of you are fat teaching? Okay. How many of you use projects for your teacher, your students to come together, to work together, think together, plan together. Not say, okay, you're doing a project together and they divide up the work, but they actually come in and do a joint project. How many of you do that? Okay, you're, you're, it's a constructivist shared thinking uh, that we learn from each other from thinking together. So if we integrate this, um, uh, into our teaching, then our students will know how to do it when they get out into the outside world. Our employers in the United States are saying, we want you to train, we want you to educate people who can work together across disciplines, across the cubicle, 
and who know how to cooperate and who know how to share ideas and who, because economy, uh, hi, um, Federica, you were talking about the money behind this, the, what's the behind the thing. Um, employers realize, why should you be doing the same thing you're doing, you're doing, I'm paying all three of you for the same thing, I don't want to do that. Come together and think about something that's going to get me a more, um, uh, more for my money. So anyway, uh, the third domain to get uh, back to cultural competence is the environmental domain, and that is completely understanding the environment in which you, the, the context and the environment, the situation in which we're working. And I'd like to ask how many of us are thinking about, in terms of cultural competence, how many of us are thinking of who's deciding whose culture is being preserved? Whose culture is being preserved? I heard the, uh, we were talking about the um, Smithsonian and the instruments, and we have the stratosphere, the, the wonderful instruments, uh, historical instruments. Where's the guitarron? The guitarron is a piece of instrument, is an instrument that's used in the Mexican um, uh, mariachi, and who's deciding what should be uh, is, is significant to put on the, the culture uh, on the, the, um, uh, in the museum. Whose culture is included? How much of it? Who decides? Are, are there people in the position to be making that decision who are culturally competent, who know and understand the kinds of things that are in t tacit knowledge. It may not be in a book. So in the United States right now, we have a growing population of Latinos. And in our population of librarians, archivists, and museum curators, we have tiny, tiny, tiny uh, percentage of, of, our, of our professionals are actually from those communities who have any cultural knowledge, which again, remember, we're talking about culture, not ethnicity necessarily, but that's a crossover between culture and ethnicity. So um, cultural competence is a very important thing to have in those professions. So I just wanted to bring that up, and, I, and one final little comment, because this has to do with what, what we're doing with educating our students, is if we want this at the end product, as an end product, then we have to put it into our curriculum. So within our curriculum at the university, we have a diversity uh, requirement. And who ends up with the diversity course is me. That's not what I consider a, a fulfillment of a diversity requirement. I think we should be having diversity in every single course. It should be integrated. I don't want to be the person who teaches the diversity course because I teach multiculturalism or because I teach about language acquisition or because I teach about um, um, uh, whatever it is. So. Um, if we want this end product, then the important thing will be to put it into the beginning and to figure out how we're going to do that. And that takes collaboration among the faculty, and it takes collaboration among uh, maybe um, the LAM groups within a community, because I am now doing service learning, and I make my students do 30 hours of service learning as part of their course. So they have to work at a museum doing service, a service project, or a library, or an archives. And now, after this conference, I'm going to break it up and say, you're going to have to do at least two of those three, so that they have more experience uh, with, uh, with, with that. I don't know, you know, maybe, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I think it's going to be very important. And then the final comment is on uh, something we, Ana Maria, asked us to talk about the theoretical considerations, and I think that there are many, but I think we have to think about something else, and it's called the ethics of all of these things. 
And uh, Nell Nottings, um, in the 80s, uh, she was a, she's a professor emeritus at Stanford, uh, talks about the ethic of caring. And within our, um, our, uh, our work, I think that we have to keep that someplace in our mind that we have this ethic of caring. We've talked about the user. Um, the ethic of caring translates and transfers to our colleagues, our communities that we're representing in our LAM, uh, in our institutions, and the ethic of caring is the user, uh, how, how many of them really have access that can go and uh, uh, yesterday we heard that uh, IFLA is trying to make sure that our countries have the technology, not should have, but have it. We're not there yet, so we're the population of us who can do the kinds of things that are at state of the art is this big in terms of the world population. And with the Latino community that I'm working with in Arizona, it's very, we have a large community and they have um, not that great uh, an access uh, a situation where they can access this information. So anyway, that was my piece. I thought it would be more interesting to just talk to you than to share my PowerPoint. So let me do Susie's now. By the way, I have never read this before. I'm just doing it for Susie, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Susie Allard. Uh, she and I are co-PIs, or we're, uh, we're colleagues. She's at the University of Tennessee with Ed Cortez, and he wrote an IMLS grant with us, the University of Arizona. We bring Latino students, Al, uh, the, we bring Latino students into a PhD program with the focus, uh, their background would be people who have a STEM background, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and Susie is in Tennessee. I'm at the University of Arizona, and it's called La Scala, L-A for Latino. And um, we have two students, they have two students, and we share students. They do part of their training at, with uh, Tennessee. If they start there, then they come to us, and they go back and finish. So that is Susie Allard. And uh, Forging our future educating and training information professionals. This is what we've been talking about. So I will try to guide you through this. Whoops, that's it. Oh, I guess she was going to talk about the big world, the big science, and the big data. And that's what we've been talking about. It doesn't go anymore. No more. No, oh, there's no more. That She just had those two. Oh, I see. OK, <laughs> sorry. How do I get that from here? Here? Okay, all right, so I'll just go back. All right. Um, I'll give you a minute to read, I'll give me a minute to read, and then we'll just chat about it for a minute. Um, I think one thing I want to make sure in this slide, we're talking about data curation. I asked uh, one of the speakers yesterday what she meant by data curation. Does anybody want to give me a definition of what a curator, a data curator is? Can anybody give me a definition of what a data curator is and how they're different from an archivist? No? What? They deal with different objects.
Do me one favor. I can take one minute from her presentation. Talk to the person next to you and come up with a definition for data curator. Just talk to the person next to you. Come up with it jointly. Come up with a definition. I think it will help if you talk. You can turn around. There's a group of three behind you. Very, yeah, I think it is very important, really. It didn't get really clarified for me yesterday, and she said, I'm really glad you didn't ask me that, and I forgot. Yes? What happens to the physical part? And archivists? physical uh, characteristics. What about data? <laughs> okay, Christina. Maybe we'll start with some distinctions and it will help us. So with, with archival, I think archivists deal with both digital and analog materials. As data curation, it's a really a concept that came with digital um, material, okay? And then the other one, I think that archivists deal with materials as sort of at the end of the cycle, when it arrives in the archives. With, with data, the data curation, I think the concept is from the time that the material or data is born through all the phases of the cycle. So it's the management of data, it's the, uh, if we think ab about data as structured, then it will be the description and also preservation. What both, I think, share is really preservation. What about uh, the museum curator? You ask about data. <laughs> no, I, yeah, but I, I'm oh, okay. trying to get a definition for curator and archivist. What's the difference between a curator and an archivist? Oh, okay, so you're talking about the difference between a Cur curator. Curator. Um, That's why I said yeah, talk exactly. to each other. Yeah. You know, you can so I think we are talking about different terminology in, in sort of, again, in those silos. In, uh, but there are some distinctions. I think that, that um, curation is different from librarianship. You know, the librarianship t uh, traditionally did not have that many preservation functions, okay? As in, in archival and in curation, there's always that aspect of, of preservation and conservation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to let other people talk. <laughs> See, Giovanni, I thought you were going to raise your hand and give us the answer. <laughs> well, I I'm, I'm do not really agree that librarians do not have uh, <laughs> um, preservation. Depends on which library you have. If you have codex, if we have seen the Vercelli. Uh, things. Uh, um, so, uh, curation, as far as we heard in these days, the difference between curator of museums is that you interpret what you have more than you just give uh, information about it. And probably, uh, if you use the the term in its actual meaning, because curation may have lots of meanings, but in the terms of the curation of a museum, you deal with a lot of people, with visitors, while archivists and librarians deal with few people. So there are differences in methods, probably. Not in objects, not in aims, which is always the, the education, and as we heard uh, previously, is the improvement, this morning, the improvement of knowledge and dissemination the society. Okay. Other suggestion from he, you, Tatiana? Yeah, uh, I, no, I just think we, we can go 
go on forever in, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, mm -hmm. telling about these distinctions, but I think, uh, as I see it from this slide, probably the most important line is the last one, which suggests that at the moment, in, only in the USA, uh, the workforce is short and estimated mm -hmm. so-and-so people. So this is what we have to think about when we educate our uh, mm -hmm. professionals because uh, the market will go for data science specialists. Yeah. Not for uh, anymore, like it was in 80s, you remember, especially in states, it was not librarian at that time, it was information specialist, who was paid much more than librarian just because of the name, of the title, yeah? and the things which were done. And the same is now, you can't do with the data science if you don't know how to describe, how to put the, the, the data on the sem in, and connect them, opening data and so and so. So this is, these are the things which are really deeply inside our professions. They are called differently nowadays. So we have to be aware of this. This is. Because see, my students want to know. They say, what's the difference between a curator and a, an archivist? If you want me to go in to tell me what I would have to do. Tell me how it's different from a museum curator. Anyway, I think it's important, and this is an international conference. We have the, the brilliant minds of people from all over, and this is a good time to get this, mm -hmm. you know, discussed so that we have some okay. clarity. Yes. One, one more point I want to make that uh, I think traditionally we were associating curation with interpretation, and that's sort of like a museum domain. And then Nancy, I think, showed one exhibit uh, from the Digital Public Library of America uh, created by librarians and uh, other information professionals. And that's actually a concept from the museum. To, as a librarians and archivists, we are not creating exhibits because actually creating an exhibit is a way of interpreting. And then librarians mm -hmm. and archivists were trained traditionally in providing information but never interpreting. Okay, we were just, you know, about access and providing information to our users. But then users were, it was up to the user to interpret. By the way, libraries and archives are now creating exhibits, and it's absolutely necessary with the amount of, of, of digital objects. It's a way of interpreting, because we are putting them in a certain sequence and providing a narrative, and that's a museum approach of presenting yeah. objects. Yeah. Yeah. So you see that that interpretation that was not part of archival and library is now moving from the museum naturally, without using the word convergent. Actually, we're doing it. Okay. And at our school, we have a big sign that says, librarianship is not neutral. And I think that there, is, that there was a, a period of time when the librarian was a neutral person, a new, neutral force, and it's never really been neutral. There's always been somebody who has to collect the books, decide on the books, uh, arrange the books, decide on which ones get, uh, how they get labeled in the um, catalog, and so we're at least being greatly more honest about it. Anyway, here's the next slide. Probably Giovanni. Yeah, but, but oh, Giovanni. I, I, no, 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 Giovanni. No. I, I, <laughs> wanted to hear, I wanted to hear from you because you had a lot to say yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I, I do agree with you. First of all, I would say that I totally agree because I, I like the idea of stressing the fact that there is a bias within our profession. Yeah. There is a bias uh, uh, in librarianship, there is a, a bias in the archival science. So I do agree with what uh, Christina said about the fact that we interpret now more and more. But I also want to stress that at this it has always been so. I mean, uh, as librarians, so you have to decide what to acquire in your phones, in your library phones. And this is a decision, this is a bias. And the same mm -hmm. is for the archivist, because we have to uh, decide how to present. I mean, the way you structure mm -hmm. the hierarchies mm -hmm. are a way of introducing the users to the archival phones. And this is a way of uh, presenting the archival materials in a different way. So mm -hmm. there is a bias. Mm -hmm. And a second point I, I also want to uh, stress is the fact that maybe in Italy, I mean, uh, if you think uh, to uh, of the 
North American approach, you distinguish between records management and archives. I mean, materials go to the archives when they are, let's say, dead. While in Italy, we are archivists since the beginning. I mean, if you work on current record, you are an archivist working on current records. So that's different. We curate mm -hmm. records since the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this point of view, I would say, I'm, I'm not sure, there is no perfect answer. I, I mean, I agree with you, we can go on and on. <laughs> and this is an interesting, I mean, maybe this is a matter for a second, <laughs> for another satellite. Uh, uh, but I, I also want to say, for example, yesterday I saw uh, um, something in a slide, someone wrote something like uh, data um, curator, data analyst, information analyst, and then digital archivist. That, that was the, the string. And I didn't like it too much because as an archivist, I, I don't believe I'm a digital archivist. As an archivist, I have to preserve things. Now things are digital. And so I'm a digital archivist, of course, but I'm an archivist. <laughs> That's all from this point of view. But I agree that we do need some specialization because some materials are mm -hmm. so different. Yeah. I mean, digital archives are really hard to deal with. So we have to uh, build this kind of skills we were talking about. We were talking about skills yes. uh, before. So yes. Before. And, I, and I think that, that this discussion helps um, us explain it to other people and to, to understand ourselves. That's that first part, cognitive domain, is to go through this kind of process to say, let's self-reflect. And we're doing that. We're saying, what is this? Where did we get these ideas from? Uh, why do we think this way? So anyway. So there's the next slide. Um, give you a minute to read it. Yes. The, the data life cycle and, infor uh, and information professionals. It's interesting. Shall we go on? Shall I just flip through them? Okay. Profile of Big Data Info Pro. So that's the professional, and that's going through a description of what that person is, what the big data information professional is. InfoPro, I guess now we're going to start using short words. LAM, InfoPro, next it'll be Cure, and ARC. Just kidding. Uh, the education and training formula. Like that. Any comment on this slide? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Do any of you feel like you're taking the big jump? <laughs> I think that the convergence would be something like this when you when your uh, your boss said to you, okay, we're we're changing the whole thing, would be something like this. Taking a big risk. This must have to do with um, uh, these universities doing this. I, I'm not familiar if anybody is and wants to explain this better. And me. More UT, that's University of Tennessee Science Information Education Initiatives. And what I, yeah, see the La Scala is the, the uh, lower right corner is the one that we're involved in, which is Latino Scholars Gambio Leadership Academy. But I guess they have uh, various IMLS grants, and thank God for IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, who they're really basically the ones who are funding our, our research. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Patricia, to everyone.
involved especially the audience uh, in this participating session. Uh, it's now the time of... Um, Anna Maria. Can I just say? Yes, sure. Talking about big data, we have many professionals, uh, pr professionals uh, such as archaeologists, for example. Uh, and uh, when I was talking to my colleagues at the University of Zadar, where archaeology is big, really big, they have so many things to to dig up and to to talk about. I asked them, "How do you manage your data?" Uh, there are so many data, they are working every day, they would put them still on cards. <laughs> and no one will be able to see this and to interpret, reinterpret and so on. So there is lots of uh, 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 bright future for our students to get into these other fields and to help them build their own and uh, cope with their own big data. This is uh, something which is uh, uh, very, uh, very much uh, connected with the educational process, but with putting uh, the students in these different profiles, uh, opening uh, the profiles for them to work with others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a really interesting <laughs> point. <laughs> A student of mine uh, at UBC in, uh, in Vancouver uh, uh, just worked with uh, archival materi um, uh, materials from archaeology uh, digs and actually uh, she discovered that, that there is no standard in the archaeology domain and she's helping to define a standard for the archaeology domain uh, starting from the archival point of view, and this is very good. And also from the educational point of view, coming from, I mean, from the very interesting uh, considerations uh, from Patricia, I would say that another way of uh, raising awareness, of raising uh, in such a way, of I mean, building a common field, uh, still at UBC, we decided to develop a capstone course, a capstone course in which every uh, instructor had to participate so that uh, students had to uh, design a project involving librarians, uh, archivists, uh, uh, museums, creators, and so on. And this may be uh, an opportunity, just build a capstone course, just, okay, it, it is just a suggestion. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah? <laughs> I'm very glad that you take out the point of paper because I would really like how much information is still on paper. We have lots in music. And which is the right uh, method to bring this paper information on the net today? Because it's a big, much big issue than everybody thinks. And uh, we have seen how Smithsonian do with the museum and the beans and so on, that's a way. But uh, I suppose that we should put this in the agenda to talk about the shift from paper to digital because it's not given that everybody has files and best information and newest information could be still on paper. Thank you so much. Um, now it's time of uh, Serap Kurbanoglu, who is the chair of Euclid, and uh, she will uh, continue the discussion. Well, uh, I'll try to make it short because I'm sure you all have plans. Um, well, uh, this convergence issue we have been discussing for two days is quite important and it will, it has already, and it will have a very big and great impact on LIS education and curricula. It is inevitable. I think the, one of the most important things is to find out about the best practices. I'm not going to talk about the best practices for education, but rather to how important and how 
we can find out about these best practices so it can help us uh, to improve or to take them as examples. And I like to, of course, um, speak for Euclid, and uh, I like to tell you a little bit about what the contribution of Euclid to find out about best practices for education and these curricular uh, changes. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Euclid first. I'll make it very, very short, I promise. Uh, maybe uh, it is not known to everyone in this room, so it is a European Association for Library and Information Education and Research. Here. Uh, well, this is the board uh, recently uh, elected uh, in January, and the board will be uh, on duty for three years. Oops, sorry. I, oops. Maybe I'll do it from yes. here. Yes. Well, we started to have a strategic and action plan, and uh, in our strategic plan, it sh seems short, there are only three items, but we like to facilitate research on LIS education and curriculum. So there will be a bridge with the uh, conversation today, and facilitate collaboration and networking, uh, and organize some events to create opportunities uh, for our members to discuss the challenges, like this convergence uh, issue, and um, cooperate with other organizations like uh, IFLA, um, Alias Eblida, and iSchools. Uh, well, some of you might know about this uh, well. It is a European uh, Curriculum Reflections on Library and Information Science Education. It was a very, very good report uh, which actually mentions in different chapters on core um, elements of LIS education and Euclid was one of the facilitators. But it was, there, it, there was also a survey in it, but it actually uh, completed and published in 2005. So it is almost 10 years ago. We now feel like as Euclid board it's time to produce a second report, maybe a publication. And within this publication, we can uh, explore the convergence and how this convergence can be actually um, uh, be uh, included in the curricula. We also have an action plan. I'm not going to read everything here, but we like to increase the number of our members. Uh, we already have some new members, I should uh, say that. And if anybody in this uh, room interested in becoming a member of ECLID, please contact me. I'll be happy to give you more information. Uh, the second important thing is organize an international conference on LIS education because uh, in 2016 we will commemorate the uh, 25th year of Euclid. And this conference could be a very good opportunity to discuss about these uh, curricular changes uh, uh, in uh, LIS education. Uh, well, we actually uh, wanted to redesign and improve our website, and we wanted to have a logo. I'll tell you very little bit about this. This is our new website, and uh, we actually had a contest to have a logo uh, for our uh, identity. Um, and there was a contest uh, among LIS students, and uh, we have this new logo. This is the first time it is actually announced. To my surprise, I'm not going to talk about the logo too much. I was planning to, but we, we, are, we, are, we don't have much time. But to my surprise, the creator of the logo is here today with us. Giovanna, could you just stand up so everybody can see you? Um, she, she is a student. Joanna is a student in ANSIP in France. Uh, but she's an Italian, so this is a really very, very good coincidence. So now we have the logo. Of course, we will continue uh, supporting Bobcats and do a couple of other things. What we can do to actually contribute uh, with this convergence and finding out about the best practices. 
we are actually planning to make a survey among LIS schools in Europe. So within the survey, we can add a couple of questions about how they are really dealing with this convergence and what are the curricular changes and, and their programs. So I, I'm sure it will be a great uh, contribution. And during the conference in 2016, we also like to invite uh, experts, uh, country experts uh, from European countries who can report about what's going on in their uh, countries. And in the end, we like to publish the proceedings. It could be like a second edition of this um, European uh, curricular, uh, curricular reflections. So uh, I just believe it could be a very, very useful uh, publication uh, in the sense of uh, finding out about uh, LIS education changes in the direction of convergence. Uh, we are open to all kinds of collaboration. I'm sure that was the second thing Anna Maria was uh, planning to speak. Maybe uh, we can uh, add more on that. We, we like to... Uh, collaborate with IFLA and, if possible, with Alice or uh, iSchools because we are um, planning to our surveys uh, in Europe, but it would be wonderful to be able to cover all the other countries uh, around the world. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add, uh, it would also be very interesting to make a survey on the students, LIS students, because it would be very interesting to find out uh, uh, about their um, competencies. Because uh, yesterday, one of our colleagues uh, was speaking about the competencies uh, which are required for, uh, as a result of this convergence. So finding out what, uh, what is the level of their competencies can also help us to make our uh, changes on the programs. We just carried out a multinational survey. We are going to publish the results soon. It was carried out in 18 different countries mainly European, but we also have Australia and United States. To our uh, surprise, actually it was about um, uh, information literacy skills of the students. Uh, these are basic skills for LIS students, but also, uh, although these are basic skills, or we think this, this should be basic skills for our students, we find out that there are so many areas our students have difficulties. So I think as not only um, information literacy, but all the other competencies we think or we feel are necessary for uh, the new LIS students, if we find out about their levels, so we can really make very good and very solid uh, curricular decisions. Well, this is all I'd like to say now. Thank you very much. Seraph. And now Maurizio, Maurizio Vivarelli. Um, uh, do you need the presentation? You speak from your table. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say something about the um, question of, um, of the data curation, etc. And I think that it is not clear um, what uh, data curation means because it is not clear what uh, are data. And if this is the problem, not of data curation, but of the complexity of data. And uh, um, briefly, I wanted to um, say this. In my, my course of the last academic year, I've, I have used a book that perhaps you know, um, the author is Peter Bark. And uh, the title is um, From Encyclopedia to Wikipedia. And in this book, uh, Bark uh, is a historic, is, uh, uh, propose a social history of knowledge uh, from the um, 18th century to, to, to now. And uh, well, in this book, Bark but he has written uh, similar things in another book uh, which title is uh, the uh, social history 
about a social history of knowledge from Gutenberg to Encyclopedia, says that um, it is very difficult to define knowledge uh, and it is uh, difficult as if we, if, if we try to define uh, truth. And uh, I think this is the, the problem. The real problem is the complexity of the, the disciplinary field in, in which we are placed from different point of um, view. Well, uh, now I want to use the short time of this uh, communication to offer you some uh, quick consideration concerning the relationships between libraries, archives, museum, and the structure of uh, the some aspects of the educational offer in Italy in this period, especially for what concerns the role of the um, academic institutions. In the first place, as we have heard in many speeches of yesterday, it is uh, not yet clear which uh, should be the areas of collaboration, cooperation, of, or integration, or, converse, or con convergence. And uh, this means that it is not simple for obvious uh, reasons to define the general outlines of a possible common training. In Italy, as in several countries of contempor contemporary Europe, whose cultural history is founded a, on a set of values selecting the 16th and 17th century, archival science, library science, and museology have developed their specific paradigm, their methodologies, their principles and techniques in different ways even if these traditions are linked by a common origin. The processes of specialization and contextual fragmentation of knowledge that have occurred since the 19th century have greatly weakened the perception and the processing of these common roots until the spread of digital technologies has produced the new emersion in a context in appearance very different from that of the early modern age of many elements of connection and I think objective convergence between libraries, archive, archives and museums. For example, problems of storage, uh, structure and characteristics of metadata, authority control, interoperability and so on. In these complex cultural landscapes, very complex and still not clearly defined, we can however see at least some area, areas of possible and productive integration attributable on the side of the job market to the professional profiles of the so-called digital curator of the data or of, of, to the profile of data analyst or data scientist. The training of this profession in any case, I think that cannot consist only in the acquisition of, of technical and technological skills, technicalities. I am sure that because of the greater relevance of this function in relation to the organization and the communication of cultural memory, it is necessary to provide a curriculum in which technical skills are part of a broader historical, cultural and interpretative context. This perspective may identify a possible and, I think, interesting role for the departments of humanities, which could usefully engage in defining the general outlines within which the technological processes are established. I think that the most relevant thing is to imagine and then define an approach according to which the cultural history of the information knows how to connect itself with the different types of technologies. 
In the direction of this perspective is oriented the recent constitution in the University of Turin of an interdepartmental center called MEDIUM, an acronym which means Memoria Digitalis Humanistica, whose president is my colleague Enrico Pazzini, I think now is in the hall, which is formed by the departments of literature and philology of the Department of Philosophy and uh, the third department is the Veto of Historical Studies. About Medium, if possible, I, I would like to say something else in my second brief communications, if there is time enough. Returning to the general outlines of the possible common training, I think that trying to define the condition for a new and, use and useful alli alliance between the historical and the technological dimension, dimensions can identify an interesting field of common, common interest between academic institution and professional association, which for their part in this scenario should deal dire directly with the educational activity, activities of professionals. Among the basic cultural education and the skills connected to the world of professions, we can now see, especially in Italy, I think, a nomen field in which we can imagine an interesting set of training opportunities. I think master, for example, for example, within which the great themes of historical complexities are oriented toward a specific and different professional context. The definition of scenarios and of training costs of a course must take, must take into account the broader international evolution of the disciplines of the memory institution according to a critical perspective and not a simple is, and sometimes a trivial repetition of case studies and best practices. Within this framework, here briefly traced, are situated a very relevant series of educational opportunities. To one of these core concepts is connected, for example, for example, a research line that I think is very promising, devoting to the evaluation and, inter and interpretation of the use of the space, physical and digital, in libraries, archives, and museums. To this line, it is a related the contribution presented in the session of yesterday morning by Marco Rubicchi, Maria Pagano, and Lorenzo Vella. The pro prospect for a more, more intensive study of this concept concept and of the contents discussed, discussed in this satellite conference are many, and have I tried to explain very interesting and significant. It is time to evaluate with attention the evolution of the context within, within which these educational perspectives are lo, mm, placed and make, it, make choices that after a careful analysis we will evaluate the best and the most adequate to reduce the complexity of a documentary context which is complex and in continuous and incessant uh, change. Thank you. Thank you very much of all of you. Uh, this uh, discussion was uh, really provoking. Uh, now I have much more questions than at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, really I think we need uh, some more uh, different satellite, uh, continuing satellite. And so um, in the second term discussion, um, I would like to stimulate you to focus on why convergence. Because um, in the discussion, we have spoken of economics, uh, we have spoken of um, probably transformation of organization, but why should be related uh, more probably to value, uh, to mission of the professional, what is our, uh, the value we give to the society? 
And then uh, I'm also very interesting. I'm grateful to Patricia to have the, stimulated the, uh, the definition. Eh? What is? What is? Uh, is a change of name? Uh, is the same but different? <laughs> and uh, um, it's uh, interesting that uh, we want to call differently. Why? And uh, what? And then how? Um, uh, the suggestion I have had uh, uh, also yesterday and today is that we are not speaking anymore of cooperation, but the new word is collaboration. I like very much collaboration. Uh, this means that we have done a little step, <laughs> a little step. But probably uh, we have to understand what is collaboration. Uh, how can we start collaboration? And so it's to you. Uh, there is no order in this second term. Uh, you can uh, just uh, uh, start as you want. <laughs> Perhaps I may start, because I have more time to think about it, <laughs> because it was previous was the first. And uh, why convergences? Uh, I think that, uh, for me, the most important thing is to meet the need of the users and to think about uh, the uh, main purpose we have uh, in our uh, job that is to try to uh, help uh, society to go on and perhaps uh, not to leave uh, people back and something like that. I am uh, convinced that there is a, a very important uh, aim which is common between us. And this, uh, if uh, sometimes we look at uh, um, big landscape, open, wide landscape, we do something better. Uh, otherwise, in Italy, uh, we, every, we fight uh, every day with troubles, with problems, and not to have a big vision. And I think it's necessary. Uh, how, the second, how may we do this convergence? Uh, for this, I make a joke. I left an idea from Marco, and uh, we uh, were thinking some uh, days ago about to build a course from librarians, archivists, and uh, curator of a museum in which uh, each one uh, expone the pillars of the disciplines, of the, their disciplines. And I uh, I agree, it's nice, but I think we need, uh, a, after, a sort of uh, play game in which we change, we change the, <laughs> the role and try to uh, imagine how we do the daily work in different uh, habits, some different dresses. And I think it could be a good, uh, good idea to start uh, just not to begin at the be to start again till the beginning, you know, Adam and Eve age. I think it could be nice to start again and go on. I like very much role plays, and I will tell you that uh, last night I had a dream, <laughs> and my role was to give a speech to the people in the market. I stood on a chair and I told to the people selling um, elements to uh, the acquirers, to the, to the people uh, buying uh, elements, that they will have to converge in one profession. Because you all sell uh, materials that uh, will be eaten. And you all work for the buyers. And you all use uh, water. 
You uh, produce potatoes, you use water. You sell fishes, you use water. You sell pigs, you use water. Not very much normally, but uh, some water. They, they drink uh, pigs. And a revolution came, and they all said, no, 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 not at all. Uh, they began to sing the Cole Porter's uh, song, Let's Misbehave. And uh, one said, no, 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 I want to continue to um, 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 uh, prepare my fishes my, uh, with water, but I don't allow them to drink this water. They just have to live in water, but I use water in a different way. And uh, suddenly I awoke and the, the dream or the nightmare was stopped. This is just to say that I agree with uh, uh, Anna Maria Tamaro that collaboration is a wonderful word. Well, I'll um, respect the question of Anna Maria. She, she says, uh, why convergence? I see, why convergence? On why the collaboration is important. I think that collaboration is important if all uh, the people or the institutions um, that collaborate can see clearly the benefits for each of uh, one. Um, it is not simple, this, but um, if this is clear, uh, then the collaboration goes on. And, and this is a problem, and this is a problem not only in this period, it is a problem uh, very ancient. Um, and for this reason, I think that medium, I turn to the, con the brief consideration about the medium that I, I have introduced. The medium is uh, interdepartmental central of the University of, of, the University of Turin can be uh, useful uh, for um, unify uh, different uh, disciplinary um, and uh, paradigmatic traditions. For example, uh, yesterday I saw the voice uh, the, of, in Wikipedia about digital humanities. And I read now some uh, lines of this voice to you. The digital humanities are an area of research, teaching and creation concerned with the intersection of computing and the cultures of the, the humanities. And... Um, Digital humanities currently incorporated both digitized and born digital materials and combined methodologies from the traditional humanities disciplines, such as history, philosophy, linguistic, literature, art, archaeology, music, and cultural studies and social science, with tools provided by computing, such as data visualization, information retrieval, data mining, statistics, text mining and digital publishing. Well, I think that we need an environment in which we can, uh, uh, we can uh, harmonize these uh, different uh, traditions. And I hope that this new institution of this subject of the University of Turin can, be, uh, can produce uh, interesting projects. One of these projects that now we are uh, discussing uh, uh, refer itself to a, a, a scenario of the European uh, Union. Uh, the title of the, this contextual project, uh, which is related to a topic of Horizons 2020, is 
reassembling the Republic of Letters. You know what Republic of Letters has been and several uh, um, institutional community uh, in the um, 16th and 17th century. And um, th this uh, project is related to another project promoted, I think, by the, principally the, by the University of Stanford, uh, which has a similar name, Mapping the Republic of, uh, of Letters. And so I think that we need a, a broader point of view uh, by which we can interpret this complex uh, situation. And uh, I hope that Medium uh, can contribute to reduce the complexity of this um, cultural um, area. I have to turn this on. Um, do we have a microphone? Okay, um, I need a volunteer from this side of the room from the back half and a volunteer from this side of the room to stand up. I'm gonna ask a question, see if you can answer it. Or, I mean, give me your own interpretation. Would two volunteers please stand up from the back half? Because we've been talking up here. Please, two people stand up. Okay, I'll just point to you. Would you stand up? No? The younger one. Okay. Yeah, young one, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, uh, this gentleman back there that was, oh, okay, there's one and one back here on this side. Please, somebody from that row, please stand up. Okay, well, you already answered. That's what I was trying, I said the back half of the room. The question is this, just tell me what you, mean or define for me collaboration? What does it mean to you? To work, to work together. Okay. Anybody else? Would share the microphone. Yeah. Work together. What else? I'm sorry, I didn't want her to have to run around. That's why I was trying to locate it in the same spot. Just hand it around to anybody. Uh, a precondition for working together is to share the same goals. So a collaboration is uh, about sharing the same goals, objectives, uh, and so on. Okay. And so to share resources, which are also uh, work. Okay. Somebody else? Just hand it over to somebody next to you. I? Simona. Yes, do you? Simona. <laughs> Simona. But I think it's very simple, like uh, definition, but I think that uh, collaborate uh, is a Latin uh, uh, verbs, cum laboro, it's uh, work together, but uh, in the real sense of, uh, of this meaning, uh, work together. Okay. I, can I be more... Um, yes, yes, uh, please to do. Work together, uh, I think with the same aim, uh, while okay. the same goal uh, uh, has something to do more with the cooperation, I think. Cooperation has the same goal. Collaboration has the same aim. Okay, well, we're really getting into semantics, but this is, this is same salary, he says. <laughs> same salary. That's why I was trying to, to explain yesterday that if we can define collaboration, what we mean, when we go into the meeting, not we're just going to collaborate on this project, but it really... If you are going to collaborate, you must be able to think together, plan together, and come out with a product that is a result from your thinking together. It will be something different from what you thought and what you thought alone. 
when you when you collaborate, it's shared thinking and planning and shared creation of something new. And if you don't come out with something created new that comes together, which you have to have that goal, shared goal, same objectives, say, share your work together, however you want to do it. You don't even have to be in the same place. I'm sure that Nancy has people collaborating who never see each other. They're, they're in different departments or whatever, but they're coming together. But if we don't have that, uh, real, that realization that it's not just working together, okay, the archives are going to work with, you have to operationalize that and tell me exactly what that means. It means that we're going to, you have your plan, you have your plan, but when we come together, we come up with those, something that we could not have done by ourselves. If you could do it alone, then you're not collaborating. If it's your plan only, you're not collaborating. But when you put the two together, it's the synergy of putting those two together that comes up with the innovative, smart way of doing things that is the true constructivist way, philosophically, the true, theoretically, the, the true constructivism is that shared thinking that you've learned from them, they, oh yeah, let's do that, no, let's, it's a back and forth. And that is hard to do because it's so much easier to just say, here's our plan, uh, we'd like you to do this. You plan it and you tell them that you'd like them to do that. That's so much easier. And I'm just, I'm just bringing that up, Ana Maria, because I, I think that um, in my li linguistic background, I think that we get, a lot of rhetoric talking about these things without knowing exactly what does it mean. So I think the exciting thing, yes. Um, I think that uh, the best form of collaboration uh, probably uh, can be also uh, uh, with people uh, that have a, a different point of view. Mm -hmm. Uh, because only different point of view, at, uh, it is not a, disti a distinction between uh, librarian, archivist, uh, or person who works in museum. Also between library, librarian, archivist, uh, and so on. And uh, probably the diversity of uh, uh, point of view, also of thinking, uh, the, the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, can uh, do the real difference. Thank you, Simona. Uh, now, Seraph, you can add uh, something. Well, why convergence is a big question, and we have been talking about it for two days, and maybe we need another conference or another satellite. My uh, answer will be very brief, actually. Um, I'll try to summarize most of the things our colleagues said. I think why convergence? Because we need to use our resources in the best possible way and we like to serve our users also in the best possible way. That's why we need convergence. That's all, thank Thanks. you. Thanks, We have another uh, from Giovanni. Since you asked uh, why convergence, I, I, I don't believe in theoretical convergence. I believe in very practical convergence uh, and I think there, why convergence? Because there are some spaces for convergence. For example, a very practical example, I'm just looking at a website, in, uh, International Principles on the Application of Human Rights to Communications Surveillance. This was uh, a document subscribed by IFLA. And uh, in Italy, the signatories were only five, um, Alcesti, I don't know, some institutions, but Neither ANAI, the uh, archival uh, associa professional association, nor uh, IBE, the librarian archival uh, association, subscribed this document that is important uh, to communicate the worries about how government is trying to <laughs> uh, make some surveillance of communications. 
And so my question is, who is going to deal with this kind of issues? It, it is, a, is it an issue of librarians? Is it an issue of archivists? I, I think we are both involved in this kind of issues. And this is a very practical topic for convergence, because we are uh, worried about this kind of uh, issues and topics. Yeah. This is related to our mission. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another trombone. There. Just about it, I would like to say that during our work, uh, we discovered that sometimes serendipity is never casual. I mean, that talking about cooperation, we surprisingly discovered that there are a lot of the cooperation and collaborative projects existing, existing in the world about the authors, probably about many other things, many other data, many other ideas, okay? But I guess, we guess in this case, that they didn't happen casually. I mean, they happen casually, but with, the, with, the, with all, the, all with the same aim. Uh, probably, uh, the, I mean, the idea is, and we were very surprised about that, because we tried to discover common projects about communicating the authors, communicating just the name, okay, and the biographical, biographical notes about the authors. And the three community, the communities we discovered actually work together. Probably they don't know, <laughs> but they actually work, work together. So prob probably uh, having the same aim it is, it is just in reality, is just in the fact. Okay, any other suggestion? Yes, Takashi and then Federica. Um, I'm very uh, interesting discussion has been continued. Uh, I'm uh, my idea to the concerning for the convergence. The in, in the case of the uh, libraries and uh, museums, so many varieties there are. In the case of the libraries. The university library and the public library very di difficult aspect to, and uh, correction. And uh, uh, we are now talking to the four concept of the library and the four concept of museums, how to converse. But uh, maybe the very important aspect, one of the aspect to seeking to the more uh, university library and the public library is very difficult focusing to uh, purposes. The, uh, I am now thinking that uh, in the case of the university libraries, uh, the same subject to the museums can be possible to uh, convergence. And uh, uh, in, in Japan, uh, such kind of the, uh, project has been done, some of the special cases. But the uh, more general concept, uh, it's a, more, it needs to more discussion. I, it's my thinking. That. Thank I, you so much. I yeah. agree, Takashi, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Federica, and then we try to sum up. I do really agree with the four last and <laughs> the two comments that have been done. Uh, we need a practical approach on an identity problem of the profession in respect of the society. This is my summary. That means that if it's true that we already walk together, the problem perhaps is the way we think the profession in respect of the other. And uh, now I have to 
make my speech as president of the Italian branch of the Music Association, we need the availability of the other professional association to involve the specialized profession into the standards. Because in the process of creating the uni standards, we put the problem of music and it was rejected. So if the standards does not uh, include any um, uh, reference to specialized profession, and we know, you know, music is a different language, but we can say Greek, Arab, or the, if we don't put a word about specialized profession, the problem will be who we deal with specialized materials. It's very deep problem. You can't put a general librarian in a music library because it simply, he doesn't know what to do. And that happened to me for years because you need, it is a need, is a need. We have to give, so we, as music librarians, we need to be recognized and the first people should recognize us are the other professions. And as this happened already, we asked for this and this was rejected. I suppose that it's related to what I've heard now. It's not the problem we are not working together. It's the problem we have to recognize in front of the other, which is our identity. So it will be very nice to have a round table, whatever you like, to um, discuss how this should be done, because this is a social process, and social processes are very, very um, delicate, and that's why I put uh, a flower on my posters and not a tree, because usually when you have to deal with roots, you put a tree, but a tree is too strong. This is really a, a little flower that should grow up. And uh, so uh, I... I I suppose this should be discussed really deeply how to present a process which is already here but has to do with the identity of the profession, so how we should be done. And this is mainly a path that should be done in public, how we reach the public level of what is already here. This is an Italian uh, conference and uh, Enrica can reply to you. Uh, and I think this is an old problem, no? as uh, Federica told us, and uh, we must uh, face uh, this problem again, starting from the beginning. Yeah. But uh, I think, uh, um, base my, um, basing my experience uh, of uni rules, uh, and um, I think that first we must uh, do what we are, each of us, yeah. in the basic level. This is the pro because it's not so easy, no? While if we start, uh, not from the beginning, but according to me, to the middle path, no? Mm -hmm. Is the specializing uh, 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 figures, uh, perhaps we fail. And uh, perhaps, as if you read the uh, uni uh, nor, uh, law, you may find that uh, a special uh, skills uh, for librarians uh, is uh, needed, is requested to know the symbol, specific symbols used in the library. So music, so different languages. And uh, we try to put the basis of this. Uh, I, am, I am, so we must start from, uh, from this point. And the danger is, uh, what we, the mistake, according to me, we have done in the past, starting from difference. Because all of us are convinced that we are different from the other, no? The, the colleagues before talk about the difference between academic library and public library. I think it's really true, but we have, we have all libraries, all are libraries. And I think also all we are librarians then we must do the next uh, step to, to, use, to use, to be concrete, to go on. Anyway, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, Just a second. No, because uh, Federica raised a very important question, I mean, issue about uh, standards. Uh, and this is a very, 
there is another example about standards. For example, uh, archivists always talk about provenance. Provenance is a fundamental concept for us, and I guess also for librarians. Well, there is uh, one of the fundamental, uh, I would say, a standard, which is prov ontology. It is an ontology for provenance, which has been defined by the W3C, the World Wide Web, World Wide Web Consortium, without any archivist or librarians being there. So it is important that we access, that we want to uh, participate, to join those kind of initiatives. We need to go there, and those are common spaces. Those are the spaces for convergence. Uh, again, it's a very practical issue. There is a provontology to define and build uh, a very practical scheme. And you need some skills to do that. And that's the space for some convergence. Yeah. Oh, thank and you. so, to, to be continued the discussion, I think that in this uh, one day at half, we have uh, developed the community of practice. And uh, we have to continue virtually and probably be repeating in Italy this conference. It can be the occasion of the conference, uh, national conference in November. And continuing also inside IFLA and with the support of Alice Euclid. Let me allow me to say what I understood from especially the last discussion. Um, if we collaborate, in the sense, uh, in the meaning we have uh, developed <laughs> in this conference, uh, we first innovate because we do differently. Differently from what we can do separately. But uh, I understood that uh, we do more. We do more. We do better, not, not only, uh, we do more. And probably this more is the digital curator definition, because it's, uh, in my mind, uh, an individual with the free background together. And so this is my interpretation. <laughs> but uh, I am really grateful to all of you. Uh, the speakers were really the best I could select <laughs> in the world because they have uh, given a so big a contribution to all of us. It uh, was really a brainstorming, participated uh, from all the countries uh, represented here. And so a big thank uh, to the speakers, to the participants. But then uh, let me say a big, big thanks to the organizers, because I was very lucky in the beginning of this organization to have, uh, first of all, Cecilia Cognini. Please come here, Cecilia. <laughs> Anna Maria Gambero. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Valeria Calabrese, <laughs> uh, Patrizia Bonino, I don't see Patrizia, thank you, thank you. Uh, Diomira, Diomira, Fortunato, <laughs> and Ezio, Ezio, thank you, thanks. And so I think that we could have better organization and better welcome, warm organization that Torino City and libraries in Torino. And we all discovered, first of all, how beautiful is Torino, how professional are the librarians and the archivists and the museum curator in Torino. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you.